refugees and migrants in the case of Nigeria will be incomplete without reference to our internally displaced persons, victims of Boko Haram's terrible atrocities. The Boko Haram insurgency has caused a huge refugee problem of an estimated 600,000 persons for Nigeria's neighboring nations. In Nigeria, over 2 million internally displaced persons from the Northeast live in various camps across the country. The world is witnessing the highest levels of human displacement on record. Over 65 million people have been forced from their homes, among them 21 million refugees, many of whom lack access to health care, food and education. And armed with this knowledge, African leaders joined their global counterparts in New York this week for the 71st UN General Assembly, dubbed the Summit for Refugees and Migrants. But with increasing migration claiming more lives by the day, will the latest commitment signal lasting hope for the world's displaced persons? And what further steps are needed to stem Africa's refugee and migrant crisis? I'm Beatrice Marshall. Welcome to Talk Africa. Now, driven by conflict, economic hardships and political unrest in their home countries, more refugees and migrants continue to make dangerous journeys in pursuit of better pastures. But the resulting toll on lives these trips are taking is only getting grimmer by the day. Clementine Logan gives us an assessment of the most recent figures. More than 3,700 people died worldwide during migration in the first half of this year. According to the International Organization for Migration, that's 23% more deaths than during the same period last year. 78% died trying to cross the Mediterranean, many of them in waters connecting Egypt and Libya with Italy. Known as the Central Mediterranean Route, it's the deadliest journey for migrants and refugees. But why is this? Well, the IOM points to what it calls new and dangerous smuggling practices. These include piling migrants into unseaworthy vessels or multiple boats at once, and this makes search and rescue operations more complicated. Most of the victims are from Western, Central and Southern Africa, followed by the Middle East and South Asia. However, the origins of a large number of migrants and refugees who don't make the crossing alive are simply unknown. Back to you. Now, as the world rallies to find a more humane and coordinated approach to solving the global refugee and migrant crisis, Chinese Premier Li Keqiang was also present at the 71st UN summit in New York. At the meeting, he reiterated China's commitment in helping solve the humanitarian crisis around the world by pledging over 100 million US dollars to help alleviate the plight of refugees. CCTV's Nathan King brings us more. Chinese Premier Li Keqiang began the official part of his trip by addressing the first ever UN summit on refugees and migrants. He stressed the need to treat every refugee with respect. Well, this issue is a humanitarian crisis, testing human conscience. We are living in the same global village. Every life is precious. The dignity of every person deserves to be upheld. Not since the Second World War has the world witnessed so many people fleeing armed conflicts, now more than 65 million. Premier Lee, during that time, pledged an extra $100 million on top of already received pledges to help refugees and migrants. At yesterday's meeting, I pledged $100 million US dollars to nations and organizations. Today, I will further promise that in the coming three years, through the South-South Cooperation Assistance Fund, China will provide 50 million US dollars each year to multilateral humanitarian organizations and relevant UN initiatives. China will also provide another 50 million US dollars assistance each year through bilateral channels. In total, China pledges another 300 million US dollars in new assistance. This summit, the first on two on refugees, heard from affected people themselves, like Syrian refugee Mohammed Badran. From the time I arrived in the Netherlands, I saw how even Europe is struggling with the growing number of refugees. There is intense public fear about refugees. As young refugees, 
We face this anger and fear every day. This summit was all about uniting the countries of the world in tackling the refugee crisis. But as Mohammed Badran said, countries are fearful of letting in more. In fact, that fear led to the dropping of a quota that would have required countries to take in 10% of the global population of refugees every year. Instead, now countries will have two years to work on individual action plans. Nathan King, CCTV at the United Nations, New York. We're going to take a short break now, but when we come back, my expert guests will analyze the steps taken at the UN General Assembly to resolve Africa's refugee crisis. Stay with us. South Africa recognizes that in order to adequately address this challenge, we must address its root causes. And that development is a key driver of the displacement of people and in turn can lead to armed conflict. That was South Africa's President Jacob Zuma speaking about the place of development in resolving migration and refugee crisis. Welcome back to Talk Africa. Now to help unpack the resolutions taken at the United Nations General Assembly, I have expert guests standing by in Lagos, Dr. Ola Bello. He's the executive director at the Good Governance Africa. In Cairo, human rights activist Ahmed Nagwib. And with me in Nairobi, Tim Howe. He's a regional thematic specialist at the International Organization for Migration. Gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us on the program. Tim, let me start off with you and with statistics from the International Organization for Migration because worldwide about 3,700 people um, are said to have died during migration in the first half of 2016. 3,000 of those uh, from several African countries, particularly Egypt, Libya. Uh, paint for us the picture, though, when it comes to African migration. What does it look like? Well, the, the numbers I think that you're quoting are from our Missing Migrants Project, and they actually refer only to the figures of migrants who have gone missing or are dead in the Mediterranean Sea. So this is strictly about sea arrivals to um, Europe. I think if you ask me to paint the picture um, of migration and of refugee movements more broadly, we can expect that the numbers are actually quite higher. Um, not all of the movements that are happening result in death, but what we do see is an increase in irregular migration, people going with increasing levels of frustration, desperation, um, and thus also relying on the help of um, people, uh, criminal networks, and going in unsafe ways. I think that is a marking feature which has inspired a lot of the recent debate we have had on migration generally. When we look at the pictures, though, uh, the numbers in general, what are the numbers looking like? Um, well, again, the, the numbers, uh, you, you quoted the Mediterranean um, figure for 2015. Uh, we had 3,600 migrants um, going missing um, or being dead in the Mediterranean Sea. Um, there was an arrival of around 1 million people just to Europe um, from, um, through the Mediterranean Sea. Um, for this year, we've actually seen that the numbers have declined. So far, up until this month, we have counted around 300,000 people on the move through the Mediterranean Sea. But what we do see still is that the figure that you quoted about the 3,600 dead last year, we are already at 3,200 dead this year, which shows the overall number might decrease. But the way that people are going, it's still very unsafe. The proportion is still very high. Right. Uh, Dr. Olabella, we are looking at uh, between a million, 300,000 to a million people uh, that are crossing through the Mediterranean Sea from Sub-Saharan Africa, the Sahel region, Ni Nigeria, Gambia, and Mali. Talk to us about Nigeria. Well, um, I think um, the, the picture in Nigeria is pretty much similar to um, the picture you are seeing right across the continent. Um, I think at least three factors um, are driving um, this really disruptive wave of um, immigration we are seeing right across um, um, the, the, the border crossings from Africa into Europe, but also from the eastern fringes of the European Union. Um, I think the first, um, of course, um, is the problem of governance on the continent. Um, we've seen great improvement in that respect, but I think there is still much work um, left to be done. We've seen um, quite um, a few um, upsurges um, this year already in terms of the mayhem um, and, and destruction being perpe perpetrated by groups like Boko Haram, um, the Al-Shabaab group in Somalia and elsewhere. 
All of those are very well articulated. I think the third in the triad, which is not often um, talked about um, a lot or not so well articulated, is the economic um, outlook for Africa at this time, which I think is also driving this mass movement of people that we're seeing. Um, the outlook for Africa in terms of the um, economic right. prospect um, is bright if you look at the fact that um, the, the, the population in Africa is young, but we're now realizing a lot of this well-known economic potential. I think all of that are now creating a lot of pressure for people. Um. We're going to come back to uh, the, the key drivers uh, for migration in just a moment. But Ahmed Nwagweb in Cairo, you, you've been across the shores when we talk about uh, the migrants going across the Mediterranean. You've been across the shores and you've seen some of these camps where the mi migrants and how many of these people still remain in the camps? What is the situation in the camps? What is the, the, the whole question of uh, assimilation, the assimilation process, if there is any at all? Well, there are uh, two major entry points to uh, Europe, mostly Italy and Greece. Uh, you've got Lampedusa in uh, Italy, where most people drown, uh, where most uh, deceased uh, uh, die on their way to Lampedusa. And then the Greece, you've got uh, uh, the islands and the main port in, uh, in Greece. Uh, the conditions vary from one site to the other. Some, like the one in Piraeus, are uh, not really in living condition. Uh, where uh, most basic needs are lacking and no consistent policy to answer the needs of those in those camps are uh, provided. So you've got significant issues in, in Greece where it's taking the major hit uh, from uh, the eastern uh, Mediterranean side. You've got a lot of Syrians and Afghanistanis and Bangladeshis and Pakistanis. And those are the major uh, ones. The waves from North Africa and Africa are going to Italy and, and those are in a little bit much uh, better conditions. However, there's still uh, the, the, the trip all the way to Italy is quite perilous and, and not many people make it on the way. And, and then you've got a lot of young miners crossing. Uh, Egypt has uh, over 1,200 young unaccompanied miners uh, to uh, Italy. Right. Uh, team, though, Dr. Bello spoke earlier on about the key drivers for migration away from Africa. He talked about three issues I in terms of governance, in terms of economic uh, uh, situation, and of course the conflict. Is that what you're finding with the migrants around the continent? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I, I think one could easily add more factors to that. Um, one could speak also about uh, slow climate change, for example. I think that was something that was recently also acknowledged in New York at the summit. Um, but I think what we should also remember is there is an increase in forced migration or refugee movements, really. But there's also still happening the regular migration, um, people moving from one place to another. And in Africa, more than any, any other continent, this has always been a very powerful driving positive force. So when we speak about migration, we need to look at the root causes, but we need to be careful there to look at the root causes for the irregular and the forced migration, whereas we should stimulate and we should actually enhance the, the channels for legal and regular migration. Right. In Agwip, though, in terms of trying to stem the tide of migration, what needs to be done, though, particularly from an African perspective? Uh, well, there has to be a partnership between Europe and Africa that is not solely based on a security policy. Right now, the Prime Minister of Italy has lobbied for a 9.2 billion uh, euros in aid to Africa, uh, but mostly focusing on security issues. Dealing with the situation from a security perspective is not a sustainable one because you have the population of Africa is 1.2 billion and in 2050 it's going to double, which means the problem is, is going to double. Uh, dealing with economic issues and uh, dealing with uh, armed conflicts and stabilizing the economy and the uh, uh, politics in Africa will change significantly. Uh, those are not sustainable approaches and you have those people traveling across and they're not being properly assimilated. Europe has uh, been uh, dealing with, it, with this as an ad hoc uh, situation rather than planning. Although in 2010 there were announcements by the EU that Europe's population is decreasing and we need by 2025 around 10 million immigrants across Europe. Now they're having those immigrants but they're not doing anything with them and they're not dealing uh, in a proper way to plan 
to assimilate them and find jobs for them or education and give them access to the infrastructure. So Africa has to have a good partnership, enhance the, the opportunities in Africa, and Europe needs to better plan the, the arrivals and receivals of those immigrants. Dr. Bello? Um, I think um, the solutions have to be found um, you know, in, in each of those three distinct pillars that I, that I um, pointed to earlier. And I think the overarching, um, you know, effort we need to see has to be in the form of closer international cooperation. What do I mean by this? I think there is um, too much pretense um, going all, all around. Um, you look at the situation of a lot of the advanced um, countries today, you look at their demographic trend, um, the, the, the clear suggestion is that they are going to need, um, you know, um, workers of the future um, to continue to pay into those, those very strong um, social security ports in those countries. And um, when people are, are not given birth, um, for the average European um, woman of childbearing age today, um, I think um, on the average they give birth to 1.3 children. And there are other parts of the world um, where the population um, growth rate is uh, much higher, and you've seen the, um, um, the pressure, the pull factor from those um, regions um, now coming in, into full vision. Um, I think we need more and um, better managed migration. Um, Europe, America, and the other developed parts of the world um, would need to be less pretensive. Right. And we need to discourse how we manage migration in a way that it's more beneficial for sending countries and the countries also receiving them. But here in Africa, I think um, there is a lot we need to do. Right. Um, with regards to security, um, I think part of the driver is the lack of democracy and lack of economic opportunities. And there is much um, that I think African leaders can do in this respect together with the private sector to try and help um, turn this challenging situation around. Tim, to get your point, though, can much be done to stem the tide of migration? Again, I, I do think it is important, and just coming back to my earlier point about this, to again um, distinguish when people say stem migration, that might actually not be what we want to do. This kind of has a connotation on understanding that you can actually stop migration. And I think that's a bit of a misunderstanding. What one can do is work towards managing migration better. But if people want to go and if they're in desperate situations, you will not be able to stop them. That's what we've seen. We need to remember also a big number of the migrants um, moving and also a big number of uh, refugees are actually in Africa, are actually in the regions that we're speaking about or that we're representing on the panel. Um, not all of them are going to Europe. It's actually a small percentage. But those that are going are so desperate that they will find ways um, to go. So I think in terms of stemming migration, again, I think we need to increase the legal channels. We need to address um, what the doctor was talking about, um, situations of conflict that have been going on for many years, uh, conflict in Yemen that erupted that hardly anybody is talking about. Um, these conflict situations need to have political solutions for sure. But in the meantime, we can also do much more by providing alternatives to irregular migration. You have mentioned, though, uh, an interesting point there and said uh, a small percentage are actually ending up in Europe, but most of the others remain on the continent. Expand on that for us. Well, I think it's, um, if you look, for example, at the, at the Horn of Africa um, region, we have um, Kenya, Ethiopia, I think both countries are, are amongst the top 10 countries hosting refugee populations for many years. And um, they have been hosting refugees for many years. Other countries in the region do that. Um, we see migrants, south-south uh, movements uh, moving um, in Africa, and this is a bigger portion, what has happened is that there have been different developments um, which have made people um, go to the north and there is more focus on the north and certainly there is um, a momentum that needs to be addressed but I think we need to be careful also not to exaggerate. If there would be a good joint international and um, cross-regional response as Ahmed I think also alluded to, this could probably manage much better and would be much less of a crisis as we're currently portraying it. Right. Uh, Ahmed, the UN General Assembly though uh, this week passed what they call the New York uh, Declar Declaration. Do you think that will have much effect in uh, sorting out the situation? Well, with countries like Germany and its uh, Prime Minister, uh, its Chancellor Angela Merkel saying that 
the, uh, that Europe's failure is because it failed to recognize that the refugee issue is a global and moral crisis. You have countries uh, w with leaders like that talking at that assembly with a, a, a global perspective that it's a global responsibility. Perhaps we might see some reasonable breakthroughs and change in policy and looking at it from a more proactive uh, perspective rather than simply ad hoc. Right. So, Dr. Bello, do you think there could be some reasonable breakthroughs as a result of the New York Declaration? Um, first, I would have liked to, um, to see an outcome from New York that, that, that portray more ambition. Um, if you consider the fact that Germany alone over the last year or so has taken in um, nearly a million um, refugees, uh, especially from Syria and elsewhere, and um, the pledge um, coming out of um, the, the refugee summit um, we've seen over the last two days at the General Assembly in terms of the target that countries would take in about 110,000 um, refugees um, you know, over, the, um, over the next year. Um, I think you know, this is just a drop in the ocean when you consider um, the magnitude um, of the challenge we're trying to address here. Um, but I think also, um, you know, one cannot exclusively focus on what more developed part of the world um, are doing. I mean, there are push and pull factors um, in terms of what's driving this refugee crisis. I think the more lasting solution actually would come from trying to stabilize the situation I mean, a lot of the places where these refugee f um, flows are, are emanating from. Um, in Syria, there was a ceasefire declared just a few days right. ago. It's not sure that's going to hold. As long as we have situations like that, people will try to, um, to escape um, and to, 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 to you know, protect themselves um, you know, and also to, um, to try and find opportunities um, that, that will make life um, better for them and their family. In Africa, um, I think um, we've seen some efforts, um, but a lot still needs to be done in this respect. Um, the, uh, people talk about the reform of the African Union. This is very crucial. Right. Um, crises like the Boko Haram and Al Shabaab and the rest of them that we're seeing in Mali and all that, I think there is a role for Pan African Union to play here, and um, the hope is that they will step up the plate um, to, to deliver on this. Tim, I'll come to you uh, here, though. Do you think the latest commitments uh, from the UN General Assembly, particularly the New York Declaration, do you see that as uh, finally giving some hope to the migrant crisis, particularly I, when it comes to African migrant situations? Yes, um, I, I, I tend to agree with the, with the doctor. Much more needs to be done. And I think the action is what we're still waiting for, in a way. Having said that, I do think um, that this summit has been very timely and a very even in a symbolic way, very, very important because there has never been a high-level summit on refugee protection and, and migrants as such. Um, if you look at the declaration, it reconfirms a lot of the international standards, which maybe 10 years ago a lot of us would have said they are not really in doubt. But if you follow this uh, speak of some politicians right now where political discourse is shifting, people are questioning more and more, um, do we need to adhere to these standards? There are some concrete suggestions in the declaration about increasing a resettlement uh, quota, working together, a global compact which play, will play out over the next two years. Um, my organization being brought into the UN, which I think is important to set the basis, but it sets the basis, nothing more. I would not go as far as to say we have seen any concrete success yet, but it certain, certainly sets the basis for it. Right. Uh, Ahmed, I just want to get a final comment from you, though. What is Africa's responsibility, though, because uh, the UN General Assembly also did talk about apportioning responsibility here for the migrant uh, crisis. What is Africa's responsibility? Again, I will go to the point of the push and pull, um, the, the point of having a strong African Union that is very strong on um, policies against uh, the coup d'etats in Africa and civil wars and armed conflicts. This is very important. And with a focus on good governance, those are major challenges that deter foreign direct investments and economic reform. Uh, those issues must be dealt with on the African side. Now, the global international responsibility towards Africa is also important. Uh, France policies uh, in Africa has not changed uh, except uh, on the facade. It still it has a, a new colonial uh, attitude and discourse towards Mali and other countries in, in sub-Saharan Africa. This has to change to show real accountability on the other side as well. Right. Uh, Dr. Olabella? Um, 
Well, I, I think, um, I mean, I'll speak from um, the, the lens I'm most familiar with. People have, I talked about um, the less well-articulated economic crisis that's also um, contributing to, to, to the, um, the democratic deficit and the situation of instability that's driving migrant crisis. The key question for me, can Africa now leverage um, this um, really poor economic outlook to try and turn the, um, the continent situation around? I think we can do it. We need economies that are better diversified. We need leaders um, you know, who serve their people diligently whilst um, they've been democratically elected to lead and when their time is up, they need to pack up and go. Right. Unless we can come together as a continent, bolster the contribution of citizens to these processes and strengthen institutions like the African Union, I think, um, unfortunately, we may be saddled with this sort of refugee crisis um, for quite a while um, yet. Tim, how you have the final word on this, on Africa's responsibility? Yeah, I, I think it's, it's, it's absolutely key, and I do think a lot of um, the solutions lie also with the AU. I would add to that also um, generally with the regional economic um, commissions, um, EGAD, for example, in this region, which over the past years has really stepped up a lot on uh, migration policies and has brought together the member states in this region to find local solutions. There's an AU Horn of Africa initiative on trafficking and smuggling, and this is really African states taking the leadership to address um, these, these aspects. I would come back to that aspect about really the potential of migration, the positive sides of it, which we should not forget. And if you look at Africa in terms of um, free movement, um, labor migration, there's a lot that can be done within the continent itself that would help African states a lot, and not only in terms of security policies, as Ahmed said, but also in terms of a development angle, angle which we have to look at. All right, and we leave it there for the moment, but that's all we have time for this week on Talk Africa. But I'd like to thank my guests for their insights in Lagos, Dr. Ola Bello, who is the Executive Director at the Good Governance Africa in Cairo, human rights activist Ahmed Nagwib, and with me in Nairobi, Tim Howe, the Regional Thematic Specialist at the International Organization for Migration. Thank you very much for being on the program. But remember, you can join the conversation at home through Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. And do join us again next week for more on Talk Africa. Goodbye.